This is the Vandy Sports Podcast on the 440 Sports Network, and I'm your host, Billy Derrick. This week's Vanderbilt football pregame show is brought to you by The Wash House, the Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company, Sutherland and Belk, and Maynard Nexon Government Contracts Group. On today's show, as well as this season's baseball content, the topics are presented by the Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company, a family-owned third-generation milk and ice cream distribution company located in Murfreesboro. A partnership began over 50 years ago with Purity Dairy in Nashville to provide purity milk and ice cream to consumers in Middle Tennessee. And they now serve Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama, Chattanooga, and North Georgia. Today, they supply grocery stores, convenience stores, and others with purity products, as well as Mayfield, Nestle, and haagen ice cream. For more info, visit their website at mpmci.com. Again, that's mpmci.com, and tell them Vandy Sports sent you. All right, on today's show, we will preview Vanderbilt and Florida down in the swamp. Three o'clock kickoff on Saturday. You can watch it once again on the SEC Network. We're starting to get used to those three o'clock kickoffs, this time in hot and sunny Florida. So a little bit different than uh, than than what we've been experiencing, although probably not too different. It's uh, It's been hot here in Nashville the last couple of weekends, although it will cool off this weekend. So the next home game will probably be a little bit cooler. We'll start first segment, what to watch for with Joey Dwyer and then Andrew Allegretta, the play-by-play voice on the Vanderbilt Radio Network. We'll dive into uh, this matchup and, and and go knee-deep into where this Vanderbilt program is right now and, and talk about it honestly. And Andrew is always uh, really good at doing that. And we'll close it out with Gator Dave, David Waters, from Gators Breakdown. He will join me to dive into the Gators, their loss last week against Kentucky, and how last year's loss to Vanderbilt and Nashville plays into uh, this Saturday's matchup. So looking forward to all three of our guests as we usually do. But first, as we usually do, let's dive into the nitty-gritty of this Vanderbilt-Florida game on Saturday, and that includes today's news. It's brought to you by The Wash House, which is also our presenting sponsor for basketball season, rapidly approaching Are you dreading laundry day? Is it stealing time to do the things that you truly enjoy? Well, let the laundry professionals at the Wash House take care of that for you. With two convenient locations in the greater Nashville area, just drop off your dirty laundry, and their professional attendants can give you back the one thing you can never have enough of, your time. Within 24 hours, you can pick up your nicely folded, fresh and clean laundry ready to be put away. Log on to washhouseclean.com or stop in today and get your time back. All right, Vanderbilt and Florida. Florida is an 18.5 point favorite heading into this matchup. Again, 3 o'clock kickoff on the SEC Network. Obviously, Vanderbilt coming off a 38-21 loss to Missouri, sitting at 2-4 and four on the season, 0-2 in the SEC. Missouri had 532 yards of total offense last week. So, obviously, Clark Lee this week in practice trying to clean up that defensive side of the football. But I want to talk about the offensive side. The quarterback position. All eyes are on the quarterback position once again, heading into another SEC matchup. Ken Seals made his first start since 2021 last week against the Tigers, and the offense looked cleaner and more efficient, quite frankly. Seals completed 20 of 31 passes for 259 yards and two touchdowns. He did have a costly interception in the red zone, but overall, the the quarterback play was better than what we saw in the Kentucky game, and and that's, that's what Clark Lee asked for. That's what he talked about after the Kentucky game. Quarterback play has to be better, and and it was overall better other than one big mistake from Seals. Now, there were some procedural penalties on both sides of the line of scrimmage, so that there's yet another thing Vanderbilt has to clean up heading into a matchup, but Seals also had a rushing touchdown to open the scoring on a quarterback keeper there, so you could see more of that and more of Ken Seals in the running uh, running game down in Gainesville. As for A.J. Swan, the original starter this season, he was listed as probable earlier this week, and Clark Lee said both quarterbacks are preparing as though they're going to start Saturday in the Swamp. The same as Tuesday. Um, we'll we'll kind of unpack today, and um, they're both preparing as though they're going to start. You know, we'll, you know, Joey will make the best decision for the team, and obviously being mindful of, of just working A.J. back um, and making sure he's through uh, that elbow. So we'll, we'll talk about it today and tomorrow, but nothing right now. I know Coach Lee said they're preparing for for both players uh, to start. Both players are preparing as if they're going to start. But my gut tells me Ken Seals will make the start uh, on Saturday in Gainesville. And uh, we'll we'll continue to monitor A.J. and and see how he's doing with that elbow. Uh, But I do think Ken Seals uh, will start uh, for Vanderbilt. In terms of the history of this matchup, 
the Commodores and the Gators are meeting for the 57th time. Unfortunately for Vanderbilt students, they won't have the chance to rush the field in a, in a single file line like they did last year after last year's win. Uh, but this year it's in the swamp, a place where the Commodores have struggled uh, over the years. Vandy's last win in Gainesville came all the way back in 2013. So it's been 10 years uh, since Vanderbilt won in the swamp. But Vanderbilt at home last year, they beat Florida 31 to 24 for their first home win over the Gators since 1988. And if you remember, long snapper Wesley Schelling was the hero in that one after recovering a muff punt in the end zone that really swung the momentum in Vandy's favor. They're hoping for more of that, more special teams heroics if they want to beat the Gators this time around in Gainesville. Speaking of the Gators, they are coming off a 33-14 to loss at the hands of Kentucky last week after committing four turnovers and allowing nearly 300 rushing yards from Ray Davis, a guy we know a lot about. So Vanderbilt, I mean, they held Ray Davis to under 80 yards. Florida gave up 288 rushing yards to Davis. So things are not looking good in Gainesville. The pressure cooker uh, that is Gainesville when you're losing games uh, can can be dangerous and, and deadly. And uh, head coach Billy Napier, got to imagine he's feeling some of that pressure. And he didn't sugarcoat uh, with when talking about where his team is at right now after a demoralizing loss in Lexington. You know, I think for me, let's not make this any more complicated than it is, right? I mean, we lost a football game because – they rushed for 9.2 a carry. We rushed for 3.41 a carry. Uh, we turned the ball over four times, if you count the turnover on downs and the penalty and special teams. They turned it over zero. Um, we lost the explosive battle. We lost the hidden yardage battle. And we lost the penalty battle. Okay, so, um, you know, we know what winning football looks like, and certainly Saturday was not that, wasn't it. Right, so there's no sugarcoating this. There's no excuse. Um, you know, all we can do is evaluate it for what it is and do better the next time. So I'm not up here to uh, make any excuses or talk about it. I mean, it, there's nobody that wants to have more success than this group of players. And ultimately, you know, I feel responsibility to do a better job for them. It's that simple. Man, it is not easy coaching in Gainesville. The pressure really heats up, especially after a loss to Kentucky, a team that Florida should traditionally beat. They traditionally have dominated, although the last three years, Kentucky has gotten the best of Florida. So Vanderbilt heading into this match is a matchup is hoping Florida continues this uh, this struggle, especially offensively. Uh, a couple weeks ago against Charlotte, they only had 22 points. And then last week, they only had 14 points. So the offense has sort of stagnated a little bit under quarterback Graham Mertz. We'll get into the players to watch here in a little bit. But like I said, Florida has been inconsistent this season. They're two and three. They're a similar group to Vanderbilt right now, struggling with chemistry up front of the offensive line. They started the season with a bad loss at Utah, 24 to 11. They got back on track, though, after that with a dominant win over McNeese. And then they beat Tennessee in the swamp in, in front of a rowdy crowd, 29 to 16, dominated the Vols. But then a couple of weeks ago, Slow start against Charlotte. They ended up winning 22-7, to but it didn't look pretty. Offensively, it was a bad showing for the Gators, and then last week it all culminated in a 33-14 to loss in Lexington to the Cats. Overall, this Florida team averaging 25 points per game, 393 total yards per game, 252 passing yards per game, and 141 rushing yards per game. So not as dynamic of an offense as Missouri last week, and even Kentucky. I mean, Kentucky and Missouri, I think, have – have better offenses uh, than Florida does. Uh, Florida at receiver. I mean, R Ricky Pearsall is really the only receiver I think Vanderbilt uh, would be scared of and is keeping an eye on. Uh, but the quarterback, Graham Mertz, as we get into our players to watch so far this season, 1,220 yards through the air, six touchdowns and only two interceptions. So he, he's played clean football. And they're getting out of the they're, they're getting the ball out of his hands quick. A lot of short, efficient passes. And because of that, he's completing nearly 80% of his passes. So uh, he's taking care of the football. And uh, they've, it's, I don't want to say, you know, uh, uh, a boring Gerber's baby food offense, but they really haven't been super explosive and dynamic. Uh, he also has 31 carries and two rushing touchdowns. So uh, we'll be interested to see uh, what Mertz is able to do through the air, but also on his legs, with his legs, uh, because you saw Devin Leary uh, on, on the ground able to affect uh, Vanderbilt's defense. 
Running backs, Florida has a couple of uh, really good running backs. Trevor Etienne, so far this year, 378 yards, two touchdowns, six yards per carry. He is listed as questionable, though, heading into this matchup. So that is something to watch. Florida has a couple of injuries on the offensive line. Their best running back is questionable heading into this matchup. That will, if Etienne can't go, that'll affect the game a little bit. But they also like their second running back, Montrell Johnson. He's got 261 yards, three touchdowns on the season. So, and they've got a lot of good running backs behind. ETN as well. So I think Florida's fine, but it'll be interesting to see uh, how uh, how Florida's run game is affected with with a few injuries up front and then Trevor ETN being questionable. I mentioned Ricky Pearsall. He's really the only guy to watch at receiver. 419 yards at two touchdowns this season. It doesn't really jump out to you. So I think if Vanderbilt can can limit uh, Florida through the air, I think they've got a shot in this one. And uh, you know, I think that points to Vanderbilt having success. Uh, because they're not facing Luther Burden and Theo Weiss in a dynamic passing offense uh, like they did last week versus Missouri. Defensively for the Gators, they're led by linebacker Shamar Jones. He leads the team with 35 tackles, and they've got an impressive edge rusher, Princely Uman Mielin. He leads the team. He leads the team with two sacks, six quarterback hurries. That's a lot, and four tackles for loss. So Uman Mielin is a guy to watch uh, for Florida coming off the edge. Vanderbilt's got to protect. Uh, their quarterback, who I think it's going to be Ken Seals. Weather should be a beautiful day. High of 88 down there in Gainesville. And with this being a 3 o'clock kickoff, this will, of course, uh, you know, get into the nighttime. It'll be partly cloudy at night, and it'll, it'll, it'll get all the way down to 53 degrees. So it should cool off uh, to be a nice night in Gainesville. Injury report for the Commodores. Uh, last I checked on Tuesday, A.J. Swan was listed as probable. Uh, Clark Lee said that they're taking the quarterback position day by day and that they're first paying attention to A.J. Swan's health. So, you know, I, I would I would venture to guess they've made their decision. I think that decision is Ken Seals, uh, and, and we'll see if, if, if Swan goes at all. Walter Taylor, let's see if he gets any more carries. He only had one carry last week against Missouri, so we'll, we'll see if Walter Taylor uh, is involved at all, especially in red zone packages. Uh, Jalen Mahoney is questionable. Grayson Morgan is questionable. Uh, B.J. Anderson is questionable. London Humphreys is also questionable. Clark Lee said earlier this week, Humphreys is available. He's just not 100%. So if Vanderbilt could get Humphreys back in this Florida game, even though he's not 100%, I think that obviously he's a, he's a heck of a player. So that would help Vanderbilt's chances. And unfortunately, Kane Patterson is out. Clark said that the team got good news on him, though, and it's not likely to be season ending. Uh, he'll be out a few weeks, and he could come back at, right, out of the, right out of the bye week. So uh, obviously you've got guys like Brian Longwell, Bryce Cowan and Nick Rinaldi having to step up. Langston Patterson, his younger brother as well. So it'll be interesting to see uh, Vanderbilt's linebackers and, and how they're able to defend Florida's stout run game. So that does it uh, for the first part of this first segment. Let's get into the mailbag now. It's sponsored by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm, longest-running sponsor of VandySports.com. So we love the folks over at Sutherland and Belk. If you or a loved one has been hurt or in an accident, give them a call, Taylor or Russell. Best folks in the business, 615-846-6200 to see what your rights are and if they can help. All right, we start with Ann Arbor Door. Looking at PFF grades, pro football focus, how does run and pass blocking by the tight end and running back compare to last year? Well, uh, I, I had a chance to look at those numbers. I saw your, your question uh, earlier uh, yesterday, and they're similar, uh, but they're not as good as they were last year, right? I think just looking with your eyes, tight end blocking specifically has not been nearly as good as it was last year. Number one, you lost Schoenwald and Bresnahan, who were phenomenal blockers. Uh, they protected the quarterback. They also helped in the running game, and they would pop out and catch some passes here or there as well. And Ben Bresnahan played a role in, in the win over Florida last year. So Vanderbilt has missed those two veteran guys physical uh, the, the the physicality is the biggest thing that that i think is missing uh, from this vanderbilt offense and they also suffered an injury to cole spence uh, the uh the the freshman coming into this season or sophomore i guess now so you know they've had some injuries they lost a couple of veterans from last year so the tight end blocking has not been nearly as good and the running back blocking i don't think has been good i think patrick smith has been good in pass blocking uh, but you know when you throw cedric alexander in there and even gillespie i think they've struggled a little bit Patrick Smith has been solid, but you know it's it's easy to see Vanderbilt does not have as much physicality as they did last year, especially late in the season when they were able to beat Florida and Kentucky. So that that simply has to improve. But it's it's understandable. I mean, you lost Sean Wall and Bresnahan. To me, that that those are the biggest reasons why 
uh, they have not been as good in, in the run and pass blocking at the tight end position. Uh, Ann Arbor also asks, with the turnover and injuries there, does that explain part of the problem with subpar O-line performance? Yes, I, I just said, you know, I, I think I think without Sean Wall and Bresnahan, they really helped out and aided uh, that offensive line. You know, a lot of times you saw 12 personnel, two tight ends, both of them in there at the same time. And, you know, they'd be on either side helping Mike Wright, you know, stay in the pocket. A.J. Swan at times last year as well. So, yeah, I just think Sean Wall and Bresnahan not being there has hurt this team a lot. So Justin Ball, I think, has gotten better. Camp Johnson as a freshman. Logan Kyle is he's not a super physical tight end, so they, they've got to improve there if, if they want to pick off a couple of SEC wins here down the stretch. All right, next up, baseball bros. Will Vandy cover the spread this game or any games the rest of the season? Well, it's a good question because they haven't. They haven't covered a spread all season, which surprised me. Um, and, and, I mean, coming into this year, if you would have told me that before the season, I would have thought you were crazy. I mean, I, I just I, – there's a lot of things I would have said. I would have thought you were crazy if you told me before the season uh, that Ken Seals would be the starter at this point. Although I did say Ken Seals will play this year before this season. So now that time has come. This Florida game, though, I think Vandy covers the spread. I, I honestly do. And I think that I've, I've picked them to cover the spread the last couple of games, and it hasn't worked out. So this might be a stupid decision here. But 18 and a half is a lot of points against a Florida team that looked awful last week against Kentucky. Uh, they've only put up 14 points, um, I guess an average of 17 total the last couple of weeks. That Charlotte game was ugly too. So I just don't think Florida – I think Florida's very different than the last couple of teams they faced, Kentucky and Missouri. They're not as explosive offensively. They're good defensively, very physical, and they run the football. So similar to Kentucky, but even Kentucky had more passing options and, and explosive receivers. So, yeah, I, I think Vandy's going to cover the spread. I'll be interested to see what the spread is against Georgia. Um, you know, First Instinct says they won't cover that. They, they haven't really covered a lot of those big spreads over the years. But uh, I think Auburn and South Carolina are a couple of games I think they can certainly cover uh, in, in those, um, you know, especially with Auburn being at home. South Carolina on the road, a little bit more dangerous there. But, uh, yeah, I think they cover against Florida. And then I'll give you a lock for them to cover later in the season against Auburn. Don't, don't quote me on that, though. All right, Knoxville door 97, most likely to happen. He gives me three options here. 150 rushing yards and two touchdowns, four-plus sacks, and win the turnover margin plus two. Oh, man, that is a tough one. 150 rushing yards. I don't think they've had 150 rushing yards all season. I don't even know if they've had two rushing touchdowns in the same game all season. Maybe Alabama A&M. But I'll go with the last one. Win the turnover margin plus two. I, I think if if this is a game, if you look up and this is a competitive game in the fourth quarter, I think it's because Vanderbilt has created takeaways and they've gotten points off those takeaways. And I think there's a good chance that happens. I, I just think uh, with, with with Graham Burtz, they might try to air the ball out a little bit more. And um, you know, maybe Vanderbilt forces a fumble. Maybe they they get another muff punt. Maybe something crazy on special teams happens again. So I don't think this is likely, but I think out of those options, I think it's the most likely to happen. They win the turnover margin plus two. All right. Next one from May, username. Should we be concerned that Coach Clark Lee does not handle the quarterback position well? Year one, Ken, after being good as a freshman before Clark Lee, lost his job to Mike as Ken regressed under Coach Lee. Year two, Clark was super high on Mike to start the season, but moved to AJ quickly, which likely demoralized Mike, a team leader. Mike gets our two SEC wins, yet transfers out. And then year three, Clark is then super high on AJ to start the year, but has shifted back to Ken. Is he going to demoralize AJ and lose him too? Whew. Uh, and then he says, I don't like the way this is trending. Billy, do you agree? Or can you talk me off the ledge? Yes, I, well, I might not agree with you there, um, but I can talk you off the ledge. Uh, I think Mike Wright leaving was not, I don't think he left on his own dime. Like, I don't think after the year, Mike was like, I'm out of here. You know, I think Mike would have loved to stay at Vanderbilt. I think Clark and the staff looked at, you know, the, the state of their quarterback situation and said, we're going to move forward with A.J. Swan. Uh, he's our guy for the future, and we want to, uh, you know, we want to put him in there, learn from his mistakes, painful mistakes, and he's done that. And now they've got Ken Seals. But the idea with Ken coming into the season was that you've got a very valuable backup who's played a lot of football. I know he hasn't played in a while, last start being in 2021. But this is a different situation. I don't think you're going to lose A.J. Swan. A.J. has a starting position and the SEC locked up. I know I'm saying that, and he's not starting, most likely against Florida again. But 
I just think that, you know, this is a stretch where they're, they're, they're giving him some time to rest and relax and heal and just learn and soak it in and soak in some, some clean play from Ken Seals and, and see, see what Ken's doing and, and learn from that. Right. And, and, and I would imagine Ken sitting AJ down in the, in the meeting room and saying, Hey, you know, this is what we got to do. We got to play clean football. Ken cannot do the things AJ can, right? Mike Wright cannot do the things AJ can. This team has the best chance to win with AJ Spawn on the field, even heading into this Florida game, right? But I think he's he needs time to learn, develop, and heal. I mean, I don't think he's still he's still probably not hundred percent, but I don't think Vandy loses AJ Swan. I, I think it's a different situation than Mike Wright. I don't think Vanderbilt would push AJ out. Certainly not either. All right, last one, or actually, we got two more here. Papa Hick for VU. Will Taylor be given another meaningful snap against Florida, similar to the one he got against Missouri? You know, that's a good question. I thought he would have more snaps last week against Missouri. You know, heading into the Missouri game, Clark talked about it. it Eli Drinkwitz talked about it. He said they're prepared to see Walter Taylor in some packages, and Clark Lee hinted at potentially having Walter Taylor in there. Um, I think they have probably reevaluated that. I'm, I'm sure Walter Taylor will get more than one snap. So, yeah, I mean, I think similar and even more. I mean, why not put Walter Taylor in there at this point? You know, I mean, you're in the red zone. You need to find a way to punch it in. You know, load the box and and snap the ball to Walter Taylor. Tell him to run it in the end zone. I mean, he's 6'6", six, six, you know, 220 pounds. I mean, he's a big kid. So, yeah, I think Walter deserves a, at least one meaningful snap, if not three, four, five. I mean, give Walter some time. Let, let him go out there and uh, and 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 do what he can do, and, which is, I think, running the football dangerously. So that'll be interesting to watch. See if we see Walter Taylor against Florida. All right, last one here from Trailbait. Why should we have hope? What's the positive spin on our future? I'm looking, I'm looking at the remaining schedule this year, next year's schedule, and feel nothing but despair. Talk me off the ledge. You sound like Chris Lee. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But no, I mean, Chris mentioned it a couple of podcasts ago in our weekly podcast with Luke. He said, last year's schedule is brutal. And I agree. I mean, you got Alabama, Texas, just some brutal home games. Georgia, of course. So, it's hard to have. It's hard to see the hope right now, um, but it looks like Vanderbilt is 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 maintaining the majority of their recruits, and it looks like they will. Dante Carter, he's been speaking glowingly of Vanderbilt. Sounds like they're going to get Whit Edwards as well. So, I think that's a big part of this. Clark Lee has maintained a lot of these commitments. You know, you really haven't seen any decommits. Really, only one. I think it was. I want to say it was Dorian Williams, receiver. Um, why should you have hope? I just think because of what you saw last year, you know, where was the hope after that South Carolina game last year? It was nowhere. You saw the controversy with Dan Jackson. Vanderbilt came out. They beat Kentucky and then beat Florida. You know, I still think that can happen this year. I really do. Um, now, it may not seem as likely, and I think it's going to be more difficult. You know, you've got some tough road games coming up. you got Georgia coming to town. But you get Auburn at home. And see if you can beat South Carolina once and for all on the road. A South Carolina team that has looked beatable. So I think the hope is that Vanderbilt's young, they're inexperienced, but they've got a lot of young talent that's just not ready to go out there and and compete against SEC studs like a Luther Burden or a Theo Weiss and quarterbacks like Brady Cook and running backs like Ray Davis, even though they held him to under 80 yards. So I just think the positive spin is that this is a young program. It's year three. Clark said they're they're constructing their program similar to the way their stadium is being constructed right now. It's a work in progress, right? So stick with this staff. Stick with this team. They'll get it going in the right direction. It might just take a little bit longer than a lot of fans wanted, right? I know five and seven season last year, natural progress is, all right, let's get to six now. Let's get to a bowl game. But, you know, it's not always that easy. It's just not, especially in the SEC, right? The UNLV loss did a lot of damage to this program. I think the hope is that they learn from that, right? Go fight your tails off against Florida. We'll see what happens, right? So I don't know if that talked you off the ledge there, but gave it my best shot. I think recruiting and the young talent that's in this program is, you know, gives Vanderbilt fans signs of hope. All right. That was the first segment. Let's move on to our interviews we've got joey dwyer what to watch for with joey dwyer tradition unlike any other joey will be in the swamp so we'll do last minute thoughts with joey from the swamp i will not i'll be doing it here we'll also do a post game show 
uh, live right after the game between Florida and Vanderbilt. We'll bring Joey in live from the swamp, so that'll be fun. He'll join me here in a second. Also, Andrew Allegretta, and then David Waters, the creator and host of the Florida Gators podcast, Gators Breakdown. We'll talk about Florida's season so far, the kind of the pressure on Billy Napier. Talk about what he's seen from Graham Mertz so far and Trevor Etienne's status. Will, will he be able to go against Vanderbilt? And also last year's loss to Vanderbilt in Nashville. How will that play into this matchup? And uh, is there a revenge factor for the Gators? But first, we kick it all off with what to watch for with Joey Dwyer. As always, we're kicking off the Vandy Sports pregame show with Joey Dwyer. Five things to watch for with uh, with Joey Dwyer. He puts that out every week, and uh, you can see his latest piece, Five Things to Watch For, uh, heading into this matchup on the site, VandySports.com. Of course, he's also got another piece detailing Vanderbilt's turnover uh, issues and, and kind of breaking down how costly have they really been. So a couple of stories out this week here from Joey. Joey, let's start with Vanderbilt's defense, and uh, you know, obviously, it's it's hard to uh, to switch these up every week. I think we've gotten to the point where, <laughs> you know, they're they're fairly similar every week. You know, you kind of switch them up a little bit. But uh, your first thing: can Vanderbilt limit the yards on the ground and after the catch? Uh, in its two losses, you say here, Florida ran for thirteen and 69 yards, respectively. So it's interesting, Joey. Against inferior competition, Florida has struggled against McNeese State and then Charlotte as well, both of those at home, of course. Um, what uh, what what made you choose that, at least defensively, um, for your first thing to watch? I think Florida has one of the most talented backs in the league, although he's questionable. Vanderbilt's going to have a hard time stopping that, obviously. And a lot of Florida's offense is the short passing game and what it can do after the catch. So kind of feels natural that with some tackling issues that Vanderbilt's had in the past, that would be something to watch for. And I feel like if Vanderbilt can really bottle Florida up after the catch and bottle them up on the ground a little bit, which has shown to be possible only 13 yards against Utah, I think 69 against B. Kentucky. Vanderbilt's got a chance if they can do that. Florida's not going to have all these super explosive plays with the ball being in the air for 40 plus yards it's going to be a lot of after the catch and a lot of things that it can do on the ground and of that sort Vanderbilt has really struggled to give up explosive plays throughout the year maybe it's off the hook a little bit against an offense that doesn't seem as explosive but if it can't tackle it's really null and void all right let's move on to Vanderbilt and, and their mistakes right you, your second thing to watch here is how does Vandy respond to mistakes and adversity you know Last week was a little bit cleaner, Joey, at least offensively. But you still saw some procedural penalties um, on on both lines of scrimmage at the offensive line and the defensive line, and that's just it's so disheartening. And they happened at awful times. I mean, just backbreaking procedural penalties uh, where they're jumping off sides uh, and and false starts uh, on the offensive line. So. Uh, I, I mean, I, I see the word mistakes, and I think of those at least last week uh, against Missouri. Uh, but even offensively, uh, the, the turnover in the red zone from Ken Seals, um, I think they responded okay last week to that. But that that is something to watch, and I'm glad you put that in there because, you know, let's face it, adversity is in football every week. And how Vanderbilt responds to mistakes that will happen against Florida. They've happened every game for Vanderbilt. Um, you know, that that's going to be important in this one. I put that in there particularly because this is a road game and it'll be the toughest environment Vanderbilt plays in to this point and potentially all year feels like this is a game where Vanderbilt could really get a wake-up call in terms of what the crowd looks like. And in its first two road games, you don't really have much reason to believe that it can handle the storm and it can weather kind of the adversity it'll see when it made a mistake at Wake Forest. Those mistakes just kept building up and kind of put Vanderbilt behind the eight ball. At UNLV, that happened, but to a much, much larger degree. Those environments weren't incredibly hostile for Vanderbilt, but this will be, and I think it's certainly worth watching whether Vanderbilt can bounce back from an interception here or there. I think that tells you a lot about its leadership. It tells you a lot about maybe what it has with Ken Seals at the helm, who we probably expect to start, I would assume. I think Vanderbilt's turnover issues are a little more solvable with Ken Seals at the helm, but you look at that turnover article I wrote, 
negative 48 points off of turnovers on the year. Vanderbilt has given up 58 and has uh, generated 10. So kind of tells you what you need to know. And if Vanderbilt can't kind of bounce back from what it what happens to it, which inevitably will happen with this roster and really football in general, Vanderbilt's completely screwed on Saturday. And uh, I don't know if there's any other way to put it. If Vanderbilt can't bounce back from adversity and turnovers and mental mistakes, no chance against Florida. Yeah, and it starts at the quarterback position with Ken Seals. And your third thing to watch is, uh, does he start? <laughs> you know, and, and and what does the play calling look like if so? Uh, I was unimpressed with the play calling late in the first half against Missouri last week. And uh, Missouri was so unimpressed with Vanderbilt's ability to move the ball down the field. They were calling timeouts, and they were going to try to get the ball back. And they did get the ball back. But, of course, uh, they didn't, uh, didn't end up scoring. There's just no threat uh you know, with, with this Vanderbilt offense, at least right now. Now, we know the guys that are talented, and we know the guys that, that can be threats, but without a running game, you know, it's just it, – there, there's no – there's nobody that really scares you offensively, and this offense doesn't scare you right now if, if you're a defensive coordinator. Um, so, obviously, does Ken Seals start? We'll see. My gut tells me he will. Uh, but we'll see, Joey, and that's obviously – I mean, you could argue that's the biggest thing to watch, right? I mean, because it kind of changes the complexion a little bit. Uh, you know, if if Swan starts, I think that gives Vanderbilt a chance to legitimately win. Um, but it also – you know, we know what he's done, you know, with mistakes and turning the ball over. With Ken Seals, I just don't know how high that ceiling is, and I think that – I'm glad you put that as as something to watch. Yeah, that choice really changes the com entire complexion of the offense. AJ Swan's going to be the gunslinger who's going to make mistakes. Ken Seals, maybe not as not quite as gunslinger ish, but threw the ball downfield well when he had the opportunity last week. Whether Vanderbilt gives him that opportunity if he starts again, I think determines a lot of how this offense moves and how this offense plays. The play calling was really vanilla, and it felt like they protected Ken Seals a lot last week. That can't happen at the swamp, and that can't happen. If you try to legitimately win an SEC game, it felt like that offense was playing not to lose and not to make a mistake. That's where a lot of the turnover, I guess, positives came from, that they didn't turn it over. They were just being so vanilla with the play calls. And I think, I mean, that tells you a lot about what they believed about their offense heading into this week. Moving forward, I don't think it can be that way. I don't think you can run it up the middle four times in a row on first down and expect to do good things offensively. Has to be able to throw it down the field. Vanderbilt, I think, can do that, but it didn't show that for most of Saturday's game. And when it tried to throw the ball downfield, it worked. So Vanderbilt's got to open up the playbook here. But I agree. I think Ken Seals versus A.J. Swan completely changes the complexion of this offense. Maybe not for better or worse either way. I tend to think Seals is probably the better option right now, although Swan's probably more talented. Who knows, though? I think this is a really interesting uh, storyline to follow here, whether Vanderbilt has – it's Gunslinger, who it believes in heading into the year at quarterback. Swan is probable. Or Seals, who is going to be with the team pretty much all week in practice. And you kind of know what you have there. I don't know if you know what you have as much in Swan. So it be an interesting storyline to follow. And uh, I tend to think Ken Seals probably gets the start. If he does, Vanderbilt's got to open up the playbook for him. Well, and also, Joey, leading into your fourth thing to watch here, the running game has just been non-existent. I think they're averaging 97 rushing yards per game. Uh, I mean, you know, both quarterbacks would love to see any semblance of a running game show up. And, and you know, you ask that question in your piece. You, you say here, can Vanderbilt establish any semblance of a running game? Um, they just – they haven't. They haven't been able to. Uh, whether it's the offensive line not getting push, whether it's not having a, a Ray Davis type of back uh, back there, whether it's not having Mike Wright. You know, I just think the entire scheme has totally switched, uh, you know, from from last season. They were a good running team last year. This season, uh, they just have not been able to establish that. And, Joey, if they can't, they've got no chance in this game. Uh, and even if they do establish the run, I, I, I still think it's probably a long shot for Vanderbilt to, to win this game. Uh, but if they do, you know, maybe that opens up the play action and maybe Vanderbilt uh, finds some deep shots from – you know, from Humphreys, Cheryl, who who had one last week against Missouri. So, Joey, that that's another big question, right? And it's it's something to watch every week. Uh, but I'm starting to think, you know, it's not going to happen. I mean, it just it hasn't happened all season. 
Right. I talk about complementary football a lot, and that's between position groups as well as offense versus defense. I think that's something to note as well with the run game. Can the offensive line help it out by getting any semblance of push? I'm not confident in that at this point, but also its backs have to do better in space. What was the last time we saw a Vanderbilt running back make a play in space outside of Cedric Alexander in the pass game? I don't know, maybe Patrick Smith against Hawaii on that opening drive touchdown. It's really hard to think of a place where Vanderbilt's running backs, since it's non-conference games against Hawaii and Alabama and have made a play <laughs> in space, really has just been completely bottled up. And I think that's that's kind of the narrative around this run game right now is just it's not really getting Vanderbilt anything outside of Alexander maybe running it up the middle and getting pushed for a couple yards or somebody finding a little hole and getting – seven or eight yards there's nothing really here in terms of an explosive run game that maybe we thought could be the identity of this run game and maybe something that could counteract the loss of ray davis is more explosive plays haven't seen that thus far haven't seen guys make plays in space outside of cedric alexander making plays in the past game billy i'm lost with this run game it's just there's not much here and uh i'm not super optimistic vanderbilt can get it going it has to though for any chance like you mentioned especially if ken seals is starting at quarterback even A.J. Swan, you have to help out with the running game. And I think both of them have made mistakes, but, I mean, they haven't had a whole lot of help in terms of their playmakers mm-hmm. making plays in space outside of London Humphreys and Will Shepard. I don't know where you go, Billy, without a running game, and I'm nervous that Vanderbilt won't have that again on Saturday. Yeah, Florida's defense probably playing angry. Uh, you know, that, that I think I still think that's a good Florida defense. You know, they obviously gave up almost 300 yards to Ray Davis last week, but I still think that Florida defense is really good. So, uh, you know, that obviously will be something to watch with the run game. Lastly here, Joey, turnover battle. <laughs> we say it every week. Um, and, uh, you know, your last question here, do they win the turnover battle? And I love how you mentioned in their four losses, they haven't won the turnover battle. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple at this point with this team, Joey. If they don't win the turnover battle, or they tie it, you know, they're not winning, right? I mean, they it's and that's that's the case for a lot of teams, but for Vanderbilt, you know, they've got to give themselves extra possessions, right? And and they cannot give the other team extra possessions because if they do that, then it's actually a disaster. It, I mean, it's it's a legit disaster for this team. So um, that's obviously something to watch, Joey, but it hasn't really happened. So I don't know if we'll be watching it. <laughs> I agree. Well, we'll probably have to watch it because I'm sure they'll find a way to turn it over. They did better with that last week, but I mean, it hasn't really happened thus far throughout the year. The thing that's really just mind boggled me is the way Vanderbilt has given up yardage and given up scores off of turnovers. 28 of those points yeah. didn't even get a chance to stop out of the 58. Mm-hmm. 14 of them were pick sixes, 14 were fumbles returned for touchdowns. And there was a couple others that were 10, 15 yard gains, maybe more returned into the red zone. How do you win like that? I have no clue. I don't think he can win like that. Vanderbilt hasn't really done anything there. The defense has actually been better in terms of forcing yeah. turnovers than I expected. Top five in the SEC in interceptions has forced a few fumbles. But they haven't been, you know, the other team's turnovers and interceptions that they forced have been crucial and they've had long returns. Mm-hmm. Vanderbilt, you know, they haven't gotten a ton of points off of those i think that's been the issue yeah seven of those 10 points were a pop-up to martel height that he ran back in the unlv game that ended up not mattering anyway three were against i think kentucky two weeks ago and vanderbilt got outscored 21 to 3 in the turnover battle in that game so it just keeps putting its defense in bad spots and sometimes its defense doesn't even get an opportunity to be put in a bad spot it just doesn't get on the field in general and i think that's really hurt vanderbilt throughout the year Florida's a team that's kind of kind of nickel and dime you to death. They're going to have long possessions. Mm-hmm. Vanderbilt cannot afford to lose possessions over and over again on Saturday. And I think Ken Seals could probably control that a little bit better. But also, I wonder how much of that was the vanilla offense because when they did throw it down the field late in the third quarter, he did throw the interception in the end zone. So, mm-hmm. Billy, I'm, I don't really have answers here, but what I know for sure is a negative 48 turnover margin throughout the year is going to lead to a record like this no matter how much talent's on the roster. Amen. Amen to that. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about all these things, Joey, but, uh, you know, for Vanderbilt to win, it feels like at this point a lot has to go right, right? It's not just, I mean, we could we could have about eight things to watch for this team at this point. I mean, I, I just think there's margin for error has gotten even smaller throughout this season. 
Vanderbilt, Florida, Joey, 3 o'clock Central Time kickoff. You can watch it if you're not there uh, on the SEC Network. But Joey Dwyer will be there. Special announcement. Joey is headed down uh, to Gainesville to cover this one. And uh, we'll have a last-minute thoughts on Saturday, probably around lunchtime or so. Uh, Joey will be in the swamp. And then after the game, he'll report on the postgame show from the swamp, uh, Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. I think it's called uh, uh, Florida Field. Uh, I think very, uh, very original there. But very. Joey, <laughs> Joey, uh, enjoy the weekend. Looking forward to uh, to seeing you down in the swamp. And uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Billy. Looking forward to it. All right, moving right along. We're now happy to be joined by Andrew Allegretta, the play-by-play voice for Vanderbilt Athletics on the Vanderbilt Radio Network. And hear him alongside Norman Jordan, Kevin Ingram. Everybody else who does a great job helping uh, contribute to the the game day broadcast, you can hear them on 102.5 The Game and every now and then 94.9 FM as well. Andrew, thanks for taking the time again. I know it's uh, I think it's been a, a few weeks here since we last met, and I, I'm trying to think of the last game. What game did I have you on for last? I can't even remember, but everything runs together now. But let's start a little bit with that Missouri game, uh, and obviously. You know, it was cleaner offensively. I mean, I think everybody can agree with that. Um, maybe not as explosive, but, you know, cleaner, uh, more efficient. Other than that red zone uh, interception, I mean, it was it was pretty uh, pretty clean. And then you saw some procedural mistakes um, on both lines of scrimmage, which I thought affected the the rhythm and kind of some of the some of the momentum of the, of the game overall. Any difference, right? Any and did you see any difference at least overall with this team, specifically offensively, as opposed to maybe the the Kentucky game? Uh, well, at, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, Ken Seals as the starting quarterback was very noticeable as we watched that throughout the course of the first half into the second half. I, I thought I thought Ken was very honest uh, in some of our post game conversations with him about the fact that the game probably moved quickly for him in the first half and then slowed down for him in the second half, um, which is great, right? He's a senior, so it slowed down faster for him versus a freshman. Um, I think Clark was very honest with us in the post game uh, that he was extremely frustrated with those false start penalties that took Vanderbilt from a third and four, which is manageable, to a third and nine, which all of a sudden is far less manageable. Uh, if you get inside Vanderbilt's numbers, if you're talking about third down one, two, three, and four, they're like... 70 80 percent conversion rate and you start to push them out to third down and five six and seven and now you're talking about like a 20 or 30 percent conversion rate uh so for this team right now false starts are unacceptable and, and clark was honest about that um i think the biggest thing i saw with ken which really deserves a hat tip is his ability to find the check down receiver fast. And that included Cedric Alexander for seven catches. I think it was 65 yards. Uh, and Cedric did a wonderful job blocking too. And, and eventually if you find that check down receiver, if you're, if you're good at, at staying out of dangerous situations, then you can stretch the field, which they did late. And it kept them in the ball game, uh, whether it was the touchdown pass to Shepard, whether it was the touchdown pass to junior Cheryl, um, he proved he's got the arm strength to do it. But, but I appreciated Ken's, ability to get rid of the football and find the, the the check down receiver when he needed to. Let's go specifically offensively. Shepard, of course, moving up in the ranks. And uh, really, it's going to be interesting to, to track him throughout the rest of the season and, and kind of how high he gets. Does he reach, uh, you know, the pinnacle? Um, how have you seen that receiver room um, progress because obviously we saw what London Humphreys has done. Uh, I know he's been banged up and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see him back. Junior Cheryl, uh, of course had a touchdown, uh, against Missouri, uh, but because of the lack of production in the run game, Andrew, I feel like we're not really getting an opportunity to see truly, uh, what this receiver room can do. Um, but in the moments they've, they've had and the opportunities they've had, they've shown up, right? I mean, I think you're, you're, you see those little flashes in games where you go, whoa, you know, this this receiver room is is very talented. Um, so how how do you think they can manage it? Because you know, offensively, with the lack of a run game, you almost feel like, man, you're you're sort of limiting that that receiver room. Um, how can uh, offensively 
how can they sort of negate that and maybe even a maybe even create short passes as you know an extension of the run game well first off what Cedric Alexander did versus Missouri is a very very good start to that uh, I'll take mm -hmm. your question and I'll and I'll move it slightly to a different column um I asked Joey Lynch in our pregame conversation uh, earlier this week which will be part of the broadcast about the tempo to the offense, right? Like you see moments in time in which the tempo seems to be really, really effective, whether it's tempo or no huddle, take your pick on it's kind of one, a one B, right? Like they're, they're the same thing, but they're not exactly the same. And, and Joey made a really good point. Um, and I, and I even, and I even ran this by Norman Jordan. And if Norman mm -hmm. Jordan co-signs on a good point, then we're, we're in good shape. <laughs> um, it's a fine line for them. I think they like the tempo. I think they like the no huddle. I think all of us can sit back and say uh, the, the no huddle and the tempo seems to be when the offense has the most rhythm um, and, and pace to it. And it's been fun to watch when they're doing that. The problem is if you're Vanderbilt and I think Clark's prescription writ large, like 30,000 foot for victories is still going to be ball control. Uh, whether that's getting off the field on third downs, whether that's extending drives with successful third downs offensively. Uh, I, I mean, it's not the the most like crude version of ground and pound and win a game 10 to seven sort of thing. I don't think that's where he is. It's just we, we've got to still limit the number of possessions and plays that the opponent has. I think that's the overall prescription for victories. The point being is if you if you push the offense into no huddle and tempo all of the time. Now you're adding plays and adding possessions for the opponent. So it's it's mm -hmm. a difficult uh, equation to come together. <clears throat> um, I, I I would continue to like to see the running back out of the backfield, whether that's Cedric Alexander or others. Um, continue to find opportunities for the tight end to make some plays. Uh, unfortunately, Justin Ball did drop a couple of catches, at least one, I think, versus Missouri. So that kind of makes you a bit queasy. Um, but, but you've got enough depth in that wide receiver room that you can come up with some different creative ways. And you can't just you can't just go away from running the football altogether. They've, they've got to find something that keeps that in the mix. Um, I, I don't think anybody's expecting Vanderbilt to, to vault to first in the SEC in rushing offense at this moment in time. And, that, and that's OK. But they do have to find something that keeps mm -hmm. the defense somewhat stable. So you're, you can't just say that. Eh, Forget it. We're going to throw the football 60 times. We're going to run it 10 times or whatever. Uh, you've got to find some prescription to that. And, and maybe that's this week against a Florida team that's that's licking its chops after, I think, pro football focus college had them down for 19 missed tackles versus Kentucky, which is an, an astronomical number. So perhaps they can gain some confidence this week. Yeah, 58 uh, missed tackles total, I think, throughout uh, yeah. this season. So they're, yeah, they're running. Typically has been good. So they're they're fighting. They are Florida. The fact that that Kentucky was an anomaly. Now we'll we'll see what happens on Saturday. But the missed tackles right. versus the, the cats was huge. No doubt. Andrew, let's go in deep into the weeds here. I I, I want to kind of get into your brain a little bit. At, sure. at two and four. Dangerous. <laughs> at uh, at two and four right now. Uh, oh and two in the SEC. Right. I think this program everyone in this program would tell you they, they're not where they want to be. Right. Um, you know, that they know they're capable of more. Clark has said there's more out there for this team. What have you learned most about where this program is at right now? Uh, you know, because after, after Hawaii and Alabama A&M, you know, you were, I feel like most people, you know, we're still in a wait and see approach, you know, we'll, we'll wait till we get an sec play. You've also got UNLV coming up. Uh, which will be a challenge, Wake Forest. So, but at this point, two and four, uh, year three under under Coach Lee in this regime, what have you learned most about just where the program is at as a whole? Okay, so I'll start with this, and I, I have said this throughout the course of the season, and I still believe it, and I will tag it with a couple of points. I still believe one hundred percent that the elevation of talent on the field is obvious. That's the wide receiver room between Junior Sherrill and London Humphreys. Uh, that's the running back room with what we have seen um, with someone like Cedric Alexander. Defensively, you can look up and down the roster and see pieces that are going to blossom. I mean, Langston Patterson is a heavy hitter. I mean, he's going to decleat some people, and he's fun to watch. Um, I know the secondary has, has 
been an elevate uh, uh, an evolution and a work in progress but you know martel height's gonna start to understand more as he continues to play mm -hmm. and trudel berry is going to understand more as he continues to play i would i would say this cautiously but i i do think perhaps going into the season and, and i speak for myself not others perhaps i did not um understand the amount of snaps that were going to be taken by people who hadn't taken a lot of snaps that's that's a convoluted way of saying young players mm -hmm. um and and i think we have seen some of that and, and i think one of the things that we have known um and one of the huge tasks in this clark lee era is adding depth of talent not just talent but depth of talent the obvious statement where I sit always is to point over to Hawkins field, because one of the things that Corbin has done better than any coach in America is amount depth of talent, where if you have a couple of injuries, you feel like you can sustain it. Mm -hmm. um, that they're probably not at that place right now. Right. So to Ricky Wright gets hurt. Marlon, Su uh, I should say Savion Riley gets hurt. Um, Jalen Mahoney gets hurt, has a targeting penalty. All of a sudden three safeties for you are out and respectfully, the guys that are coming in don't have the same number of snaps, uh, snaps, nor are they expected to play at the same level as that that front line. And then, OK, so you got three new safeties and then you pair them with a couple of younger cornerbacks that that you feel are talented, but they're still growing. All, all of a sudden, that's a that's a different deal in the secondary now. Um, so I, I still believe this program is absolutely 100 percent elevated the talent elevated the expectations has moved this thing in the right direction i will speak for myself and myself only that perhaps i didn't um whatever the right way of phrasing it is didn't didn't give enough gravity to perhaps the number of snaps that would be taken by underclassmen and that i mean like and 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 like that just is what it is. Like we saw it with the baseball team last year. Uh, R.J. Austin, mm -hmm. inc incredible hits, hits a couple of huge, a double or a home run in the SEC tournament versus, uh, what was it? Was it? Uh, it was Florida and then A and M, Florida yeah. and then, or maybe one was Alabama and then one was Florida. Um, yeah. But he was also a freshman and he had a, a stretch versus Arkansas that was challenging defensively. Right? Um, you're gonna take those hits with younger players it's just it's life but you know that the skill set is there so you know it's a it's a it's a process oriented program and, and i think i think what we see every single day is those guys getting out there and working really really hard and you know if the missouri game is a cue they obviously were able to clean up some of their mistakes not all but some of them and that's what you're that's what you're looking for I mean, you're looking for wins. Ultimately, I get that. But to get to the wins, it's about taking care of your business week in and week out. And if nothing else, the Missouri game was a was a movement in the right direction. Well, and, and Andrew, I want to point to last year as well. I, I mean, you know, after that South Carolina game last year, I, I remember Clark, you know, clearly saying, you know, I don't know if he said we're at a crossroads, but, you know, you, you felt like okay, you know, this team, they got to keep, they got to keep pushing, right? Keep pushing. And they end up getting a couple of SEC wins, right? Against, uh, against Kentucky and Lexington and then Florida this year, slightly different, but I, I still think, you know, wins are out there and, and more is out there uh, for Vanderbilt. For, in, in your opinion, what, what is there to look forward to the rest of this season? Right. I, I know you mentioned the young guys, right? Martell height, um, you know, Cheryl Humphreys. I think th th those are guys that fans like watching and enjoy watching because they get a little bit of a taste for the future, right? You know, I mean, Cheryl's touchdown, we hadn't really seen that yet this season, but I think that points to, you know, some some success in the future with those guys. So down the stretch of the season, what are some things you're watching, uh, maybe along with Norman and Kevin, uh, to maybe say, hey, you know, let, let's wait and see here. These There's, there's talent in this program. It's just got to sort of, take some time to, to grow and blossom. Well, first off, in regards to last year, I mean, specifically, you mentioned the South Carolina game. Uh, CJ Taylor flat out told us that the South Carolina game was extremely frustrating for them. 
and that was their driving motivation to to improve and get better and, and play the way that they needed to to get victories versus Kentucky and Florida. Um, I don't know that there will be one of those quote unquote moments this year. Um, I I think you're I mean you're still driving for execution, success, uh, victories. You're still driving for all of those things. Clark isn't like all of a sudden sitting in his office going like let me scheme for 2027. Like that's not. That's not where he is. Right. That's not where anybody is. They're they're scheming for the week in front of them, which is Florida. Um, I, I I just want to go see them play really good football, and that might be like a hyper simplistic statement, but um, you want to be able to go out there every single week and feel like your talent reached its potential in that given moment. Um, I want to see them go play really good football down in Gainesville. Uh, don't have the false start penalties, uh, find a way to move the football, find a way to get off the field on third down, take advantage of the opponent's uh, weaknesses, uh, whatever they happen to be, right? Um, uh, there, there's going to be games that I think reasonable minds can say are are more challenging than the next. Obviously, we understand what waits at First Bank Stadium in a couple of weeks, but you – you just you just drive to the week that you're in. I, I think that's all that anybody can do. Uh, so I, I I hesitate to go back into the, like the oh you know we should do X Y and Z and we should get this number of wins and this is what I'm looking for now the future and this that I think I think I just sit here and we talk about every single week. This is what we have as puzzle pieces. How can we put them out on the field to deliver the best possible version of Vanderbilt football? I, I I recognize that I'm providing something akin to coach speak. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, also, my son made this bracelet. It's got little black. I and like gold. it. Yeah, little They're black colorful. and gold hearts. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, I think you just take the week in front of you and you figure out what your best best puzzle pieces are. And I think any one of us that watch Vanderbilt football on a regular basis, if we feel like the best version of Vanderbilt football came forward. One, we'll be okay with that. And and two, I think by proxy, that's just that's gonna make you competitive in ball games and, and win some ball games. Lastly here, Andrew, uh, you mentioned that the trip to Gainesville. Uh, I think is this your second? second. This is your yeah. second trip to Gainesville. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh we, you know, we've seen this program in Gainesville. Uh obviously it wasn't pretty, but last year Vanderbilt beat Florida at home for the first time since 1988. Uh, and they've beaten Florida in the swamp before. It hasn't happened. Uh, I want to say since 2013, 13, uh, I'm not, yep. yeah. Okay. So 2013. So, you know, we've seen some matchups in, in the past history between Vanderbilt, Florida that have been competitive, that have been close and, and, and Florida has to really earn everything when, whenever they play Vanderbilt, we saw that last year. What are you looking for, uh, in this matchup? Uh, what are your sort of things to watch? We ask Joey every week for his things to watch, but yeah. what are, what are you watching uh, up in the booth? I'm really curious to see how the defense matches up with Florida's offense. Um, I think the obvious thing would be, okay, Florida's defense just gave up, you know, like a season's worth of yards on the ground mm -hmm. to Kentucky. Um, that will be obviously something that is very compelling. But I'm also really curious to see what Florida's offense looks like. Um, and I, I, I say it, they're not perfect parallels. But Florida has some of the same quote unquote issues that Vanderbilt deals with, meaning right. that they don't have all of the tools in the toolkit to do whatever they want. They still have some missing pieces. They still have some weak links. For instance, their offensive line uh, has a dealt with some injuries and B they lost four starters from last season. They lost four backups from last season. That is a new offensive line that clearly is not as cohesive as you would like. What that has translated to is an offense for Florida that kind of like Vanderbilt has struggled to run the football. They've got a good transfer quarterback in Graham Mertz. He's like 80% completion percentage. But the mm -hmm. reason that it's so high is uh, one of those analytical stats Um his average depth of target is last for any starting quarterback in the SEC. It's like six yards per target. They are not throwing down the field. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that Vanderbilt won't see deep threats, and it doesn't mean that they're going to stop them. I'm just interested to see how Florida tries to metaphorically square that circle 
of a team that can't really run the football as well as they would like. And they're not going down the field. They're doing a lot of check down throws to running backs. It, it's, it's an interesting offense that doesn't really feel like it's got it figured out. And I'll be curious to see how Vanderbilt defends them and if they can throw them off schedule, right? Like if Florida can't really, if, if, if Vanderbilt can defend the run and they're keeping the ball in front of them on the checkdowns, all of a sudden it's third down and seven, third down and six, and you've got a chance to get off the field. I want to see if that can come together for Vanderbilt. We'll see. Three o'clock kickoff down in Gainesville, Vanderbilt and Florida, both teams probably playing angry, trying to get back on track, trying to play desperate. And we'll see what happens. Andrew, uh, enjoy the trip and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Billy. And to close out our Vandy, Vandy Sports pregame show, David Waters, creator and host of the Florida Gators podcast, Gators Breakdown. He's known as Gators Dave, or Gator Dave. I've been having him on for a while. Uh, David, let's uh, let's hop right in, man. There's a lot to get to uh, heading into this matchup. We, we were just talking off air, two teams that are unhappy. Maybe Florida yeah. is uh, a little bit more unhappy, so uh, we'll see how that plays into this matchup. But let, let's dive into the Gators for a little bit here uh, for, for, for the Vandy fans that may not know as much as they need to know about Florida. So far, of course, they, they looked really good when, when Tennessee came to town. I think some Vandy people were happy to, to, uh, <laughs> to watch that beat down. Uh, but then, you know, you kind of struggle a little bit against McNeese, but, you, you know, you get the win. And, uh, you know, after that, Kentucky happens. So what, what, what's the mood around Gainesville right now? And, uh, and, and how would you describe kind of the, I guess, the pressure cooker that, uh, that it is right now under Billy Napier? Yeah, it was uh it was the Charlotte game that they struggled in. They did play McNeese. Charlotte, not yeah. not McNeese. Oh, yeah. I, I, they're both <laughs> cupcakes. Yeah, I, you, you, I, the, no no problem there. Uh, yeah, it's been you know we were talking off air coming on. It's been the roller coaster that it kind of was last year too. And even Billy Napier said it himself in the locker room. You, know, you they, these when when the team gets a win or any any game, you know you get these highlight videos after the fact. So Florida puts out a highlight video, and there's Billy Napier in the locker room after the Tennessee game saying, "Hey." We did this last year too. We would get a win over a big team, and then we wouldn't be able to follow it up. We could just no, we couldn't build any momentum. Let's not be that team. They were uh, like you said, lackluster performance versus Charlotte. It was twenty-two to seven. Florida had a kick, one touchdown, and then five field goals, I believe, uh, in, in that game. Just couldn't put the ball in the end zone. <laughs> and then maybe that was the precursor to what we saw last week versus Kentucky. You know, this team cannot handle momentum. They could not carry the big win over Tennessee into something more. And that's what Gator Nation, the fan base, wanted to see this year. They wanted to see better football, clean football. And then if you if you get that big win, which they did versus Tennessee, turn that into something more, and Florida just hasn't been able to do that. And a lot of it, too, and even going back to last year's Vanderbilt game, Florida just, for whatever reason, stinks on the road uh, under Billy Napier. I mean, I, I'll put it just like it is. Uh, only one road win since Billy Napier's been hired. That was mm -hmm. last year at Texas A&M. He's one and seven overall, one and five in true road games, uh, and that reared its head last week versus Kentucky. I mean, first of all, I don't want to take anyone, anything away from Kentucky. They they put it on Florida. They were ready to play. They were the more physical team on both sides of the line of scrimmage. It showed. They put it on Florida. Florida was not ready to play once again on the road. I don't even know how much of a difference that would have made. Kentucky was just on their game last week uh, when, when they played Florida, but you know it was just a continuation of. A lot of mistakes, a lot of penalties for Florida, special teams mistakes as well. And it's just the same issues that are mounting up. And something the fan base just wanted to see is just go play better football this year in year two under Billy Napier. Haven't necessarily seen that yet. Dave, let's hop into Graham Mertz here. It's interesting looking at his stat line last week. Uh, he played pretty well uh, 25 of 30, 244 yards, and a couple of touchdowns. And I, I noticed at the end there, felt like Florida was able to get a little bit of rhythm and some momentum. I saw Ricky Pearsall had a big catch there late against Kentucky. What have you seen? How would you describe Mertz's season so far? Because there was a lot of, I don't know about hype is the right word, but there was just a lot of controversy. He was a very polarizing figure yeah. coming into the season, right? Some people had high hopes for him. A lot of people said he's awful, right? I mean, there, it was there was really no in between. So how would you describe his uh, his season so far under center? Uh, safe and conservative. Uh, you do look at, I mean, he's got near for the season, near 80% completion percentage, but it's not a lot down the field. It's a lot of check downs. It's relying on Ricky Pearsall a lot. He's by far and away the leading receiver for the Gators. 
in a better built offense, Ricky Pearsall is not a number one receiver. He's a he would be a really good number two, a really good number three in a team that would should have a pure big number one. He's a number one in this Florida offense, and that that kind of explains some of the limitations there. But then after that, you know, we're relying on Trevor Etienne in the passing game, Montreal Johnson in the passing game as receivers, which we wanted to see more of this year but not as your second and third most targeted receivers right now. Part of that's to do Eugene Wilson being hurt this year as well. We'll see if he's back this week, Uh, but that plays a factor into it too. But it is a lot of, he's he's earned the nickname Captain Checkdown because that's just kind of (laughs) what we've seen from Graham Mertz a lot this year. They did try to push the ball early down the field versus Kentucky last week, but he was able, he, he missed on those. He started really slow, but I think he hit his last 15 passes of the game, if I remember right. So um, two interceptions on the year, and even both of those have been kind of fluky. So he, he most of the part taking care of the football, but it's just not a lot of threat uh, for to go down the field to get a lot of yards um, it, through the air, kind of relying on maybe if there's going to be an explosive in the passing game, maybe a catch and run uh, for, from the receivers there. But um, I know that, that there's this thought out there, maybe Florida can open it up more with him, especially given – the lack of running game, which is kind of surprising for Florida this year. And that's, and that's been the thing. When Graham Mertz signed at Florida, the things I asked myself was, all right, this Florida run game is probably not going to be as good as it was last year. You don't lose Osiris Torrance on the offensive line and be better the next year. You just mm-hmm. don't. I don't care if you've got Trevor Etienne and Montreal Johnson. That's how special he was. I knew the offensive line was going to take a step back. I didn't think it was going to be this much of a step back. So I don't think Graham Mertz so far – Unless Billy Napier is going to change some things in the offense to open it up a little bit more, that he's enough in this offense to make up for a lack of a running game. I think that's what hurts him the most. If you pair him with that first half performance we saw against Tennessee and that run game, he's perfectly fine. He can carry this offense, but he can't put the the game cannot be put on his shoulders to go carry this offense. I don't think so. I know some people think, hey, let's open it up. I think he's got it in him and spread it out with receivers. I got to see that before I'm ready to believe it. Uh, but maybe it's worth a try because this Florida offense with the run game has been inconsistent. So it's just how much are they going to ask him to do from here on out if the run game can't get going? All right, defensively, David, uh, 17 points per game is what Florida's averaging. Uh, opponents are averaging, so it's obviously pretty solid. And I'm, I'm looking here, 275 uh, total offense uh, per game, which in this day and age is pretty good. So Florida's defense – Especially going into that Kentucky matchup was was heralded. I mean, this this yep. vaunted Florida defense, um, and I, I think they are still good. I mean, Kentucky that I think they caught Kentucky at a bad time. Kentucky's really good, um, and uh, you saw what they did against the Josh Heupel offense. I know it's not yeah. last year's Josh Heupel offense, but this Florida defense is good. I don't I don't care what anybody says. Now maybe they're not as good as advertised heading into Kentucky, but uh, what have you seen from them defensively, and uh, what? Uh, what scares offenses with, with when they, when they throw on the tape of the the Florida defense? Yeah, they're deeper, faster, stronger up front. That that is where it starts to hit the transfer portal hard in the offseason and is able to come out with Cam Jackson and Caleb Banks, two guys there that are key cogs in the middle of that defense. Uh, so, but as you said, the Kentucky, yeah, they probably caught that at a wrong time. Kentucky had almost every game this season and even in the offseason to prepare for Florida. Uh, when, when you want to look at, you know, the schedule of the cupcakes and then they open up conference play with Vanderbilt and then Florida, you know, so they were able to concentrate on a lot mm-hmm. of early, you know, pre- preparation with Vanderbilt and Florida. You know, they didn't have to, the, those teams that they played before that, eh, that sorry, Van, K- Kentucky was working on things <laughs> in those games. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, there were some things that they did not put on film in those games that really showed up in the Florida game. They started using more gap scheme uh, in, in, in the run game, which they had kind of been more of a zone running team mostly scrapped that against Florida. I guess they saw something in preparation that they thought that would be a success versus Florida. And it was, and it was, but as you said, I don't necessarily want to throw away the first four games of this Florida defense. They have turned it around much better than they have been in years past. Uh, It starts up front, but it's the young guys making plays too. I mean, a, a lot of it too. Florida's top two defenders, at least for snaps played and tackles are true sophomore Shamar James at linebacker and true freshman Jordan Castell at safety. Uh, so if Florida's relying on some young guys to, to get the experience and they're really excelling so far in the first four games of the season, I, I do think last week versus Kentucky was, uh, a, 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 I'll, I'll pile that up to more of a, just a bad day. Uh, I think the first four games did show us enough. Now, as you said, are they as good as they showed in the first four games? Maybe not that good, but we were just looking for 
any kind of improvement on that side of the ball this year. They are improved for sure on, on that side of the ball. So eager to see how they finish out this year. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think the Kentucky game is an indication of just what, what we're going to see for the rest of the year. All right, let's dive into this matchup. Vanderbilt, Florida coming up Saturday, 3 o'clock in Gainesville. And I want to start by tabling it with last year's game. Uh, <laughs> somehow, Vanderbilt was able to pull it off last year, 31-24 in Nashville, their first win over Florida at home since 1988. Uh, I had no idea that uh, that was the case until, you know, right after the game we were walking out and somebody had told me. But, David, how does that play into this matchup? I saw a quote from Montreal Johnson saying he was crying after that one and, uh, you know, it was obviously tough to handle, tough to handle for fans, for the players, for coaches. And so how do you think that last year, the pain from last year plays into this season's matchup? I think it pays a lot. Uh, pay, I think it's there a lot because going back what I went to earlier in the episode, Florida was coming off a win at Texas A&M, which is their only road win. They had blasted South Carolina the week before. Right. Florida was feeling really good going into that game in Nashville last year, and it just came crashing down uh, there. So it was uh, you know one of those things where they just couldn't build on any momentum, uh, and that really started with Vanderbilt uh, last year in the late in the season. You know, we looked at November last year saying, hey, Florida could really go beat A&M, could beat South Carolina, beat Vanderbilt, and just had this big, humongous showdown at the end of the year with Florida State. Well, we didn't even get to the Florida State game. It was Vanderbilt who put it on Florida, you know, the, the week before the FSU game. And look, it goes back to something that I've been tracking a little bit for Florida and, that, and what I was bringing on and relating it to this season a little bit too. Florida needs to run game. Florida couldn't run the ball last year on Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. They had to put the game on the quarterback's arms. They put it in last year. That was Anthony Richardson. Look, he threw for 400 yards and Florida still lost the game. Uh, so the stat I've been tracking – the highest number of completions Florida has won under Billy Napier is 28 at Texas A&M. Anytime a Florida quarterback throws over 30 times, it's been a loss. Wow. And that was and that happened last year in Nashville. Uh, so it's, it, it, we've been tracking that. U- Utah this year, over 30 attempts, a loss. Kentucky, same way. Uh, so, you know, it's now it's just something to look for here. But now, now Vandy comes to the swamp. Florida plays much better at home. Um, under Billy Napier than, than they do on the road. But, yeah, I mean, I know for Gator fans probably don't want to hear it or make it sound like this, but it is a revenge game in some ways versus Vanderbilt because, you know, they, they did put it on you, uh, and now you took them for granted. You may have took them for granted last year. Better not be taking them for granted this year. Yeah, Florida heavily favored, and, you know, I think the swamp plays into that. You know, you, you usually look at uh, the point point totals there, point differential, and say, oh, being at home maybe gives you three or four points. Uh, I think, in this case, gives Florida a lot just because they're at <laughs> home, and, and yeah. revenge factor plays such a role uh, in, in college football, Dave. So, specifically here, uh, right, I, it's a little bit different than last year's matchup, I think. Mike Wright and Ray Davis last year played well against Florida and you saw some things like you saw that tight end touchdown from Ben Bresnahan who hadn't really done anything for Vanderbilt last year um, so looking in in at this one obviously Vanderbilt coming in with a totally different offense uh, so for Florida they've got a different style to prepare for so with you specifically in this matchup what are you looking at uh, you know if if this happens Florida will end up winning or if if this happens Vanderbilt might end up winning uh, to me, it's the, it is the Vandy passing game uh, and those weapons that they have at receiver. You know, I know quarterback could be in question uh, of who's going to play for quarterback for Vanderbilt, unless you have more on that uh, than from what I've seen this this week. I might but let it, you know after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. But um, there's still the weapons at receiver there. And, and, and I, I think, you know, in, in looking at this game for Florida, it's just been up and down, I think, in, in, in coverage down the field as far as, you know, the quarterbacks versus receivers. And, I mean, I, it's just for, – for Florida's defense, it starts with stopping the run. And we saw that versus Kentucky last week. And Ray Davis thinks he's not for Vanderbilt anymore, but Florida saw him last week. So he can't, he can't beat us two weeks in a row since he's not in a Kentucky uniform there. But I, I do think it starts with Florida, even with the weapons at receiver. Just don't let Vanderbilt get in a groove in the run game. I do think that's where Florida can get hurt. Uh, they haven't let anybody do it this year except for Kentucky last week. 
Utah had some hits here, here and there to to get some big gains in the run game, and that was some of the, some of the quarterback run game as well uh, to to hurt there. So I, I am looking up to see you know how Florida's defensive backs match up with with, with Vandy's receivers. Uh, even if the Vandy run game can't get going, um, it would be disappointing if Vanderbilt's run game didn't get going, but they were still able to pass on Florida. I think that would be uh, what I would be looking for in, in this matchup. But uh, if Vandy's able to get that run game going, then I really start to worry because then you really probably have to start concentrating on stopping the run and you start leaving one-on-ones with those Vandy receivers. There's some, there's some, there's, there's some matchups there. I think they could take advantage of Florida there. All right, Dave, uh, injury report here. I saw where Trevor Etienne is questionable. Um, again, I, I told you before, you never know how serious those those questionable tags can be. I think Vandy fans saw that and go, whoa, you know, he's he's one of their backs. Of course, you also have, I think, Montreal Johnson back there still, right? So mm-hmm. Florida's got a stable of backs there. Uh, how concerning is that for Etienne? And maybe who are, I saw there's some other guys that might be uh, questionable or out heading into this matchup. Any uh, Any intel there? Yeah, it would be with the the run game just in general. Uh, starting left tackle Austin Barber's listening to this questionable as well. Kingsley Aguakin, the starting center for the Gators, is questionable. He played last week versus Kentucky. Uh, his first game he played this year was the Tennessee game, and that's where we thought, okay, well, Kingsley's back. Great performance versus Tennessee. We thought that's what we would keep getting, uh, but he's been dealing with a high ankle, uh, so that's what they're trying to save him when when they can. So. With that high ankle, he's probably going to be on the injury report all year. I think we will have to wait till Saturday to see if he actually suits up and plays for Florida or not. Um, but for ETN, yeah, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, usually for a player of his stature, we would hear something along the lines of, hey, something happened here. Uh, but no, we, we didn't. I and mean, to, to see him on the injury report, Billy Napier did not give much insight whatsoever uh, in, in, in the issue or if he was – may play on Saturday. It seems like well, we're, we really are going to, I mean, I'll ask around and look around for Thursday, Friday as well, but you know, we'll, we'll see how serious it is, but it may be one of those. We'll have to wait till Saturday to actually see uh, if ETN lines up. But if, if Barbara can't go and a Guacan can't go and ETN can't go, that's a huge, huge hit for Florida's run game. Uh, we've seen this for offensive line, not play at their best when they've had to rely on some of the backups. Uh, so that would be the, the worry and the concern there. A lot of that we saw versus Charlotte. You know, Florida was playing with three backup offensive linemen, and Charlotte won every short yardage defensive battle. Uh, that was worrisome. As I said, it was kind of a precursor maybe of this team just not being able to to handle momentum and and, and be ready to play. That could rear its head Saturday if Barber, Aguakin, and Etienne are not ready to go as well. We'll see. Vanderbilt in Florida, 3 o'clock uh, down in Gainesville on the SEC Network. And, David, give people a chance here real quick before I close it out to v- see your work. I know you got a, a full preview of this matchup up, uh, I think, on yep. your YouTube. So um, where, where can people find you? Yeah, uh, GatorsBreakdown.com. You can just kind of the hub for everything right there for Gators Breakdown. But, yeah, YouTube, your favorite podcast platform out there as well. Uh, your big preview of uh, Florida Vanderbilt up there right now. Love it. Love it. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Thanks, Billy. That'll do it for another edition of the Vandy Sports pregame show heading into Saturday's matchup. Vanderbilt in Florida, 3 o'clock kickoff at Ben Hill Griffin Stadium in Gainesville. They call it the Swamp for a reason. Tough place to play. It's been 10 years since Vanderbilt beat Florida in Gainesville. That was under James Franklin. If you remember, Dron Seymour had a big day. Can Vanderbilt's running backs do a similar thing? We will see. Stay tuned. It's going to be a fun one in Gainesville. Keep in mind, though, before we end it, this podcast has always been free, and we plan for it to stay free. So here's how you can help keep it that way. First, give the podcast a review and a five-star rating. That helps us get noticed. If you're listening and haven't subscribed to VannySports.com, please do. It's $99 a year or $9.99 a month and helps us tremendously. Secondly, subscribe to our Vanny Sports YouTube channel. We've got tons of content. Loaded up every day on uh, on our YouTube channel. That's free as well. Press conferences, last minute thoughts, post game shows, pre game shows, all kinds of content going up on our YouTube channel. So so go subscribe to that and give us a thumbs up on our latest video as well. Finally, if you're interested in sponsoring the show, email Chris Lee at chrislee70 at gmail.com. Again, that's chrislee70 at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you again soon with more episodes of the Vandy Sports Podcast.